Well, uh, thank you. And uh, we're going to continue right on with uh, transparency, uh, with a very specific form of transparency. So, so the question is very straightforward. How do we make qualitative research transparent? And as kind of the second, uh, the, the uh, previous talk alluded to, we actually have a pretty good model of how to do this with most quantitative research. We have some sort of data set. Most of the time it's in matrix form. We have some sort of computer code. <clears throat> we put uh, both of those things in a data repository, and yay, open science. Everything is great. Um, here's the problem with qualitative research. This is not how qualitative research works. So this model doesn't work. Um, a typical model about how a qualitative researcher would proceed in their analysis and data is that they would have all these different uh, data pieces, primary sources, interviews, all those sorts of things, and there would be some analysis that might be implicit or explicit, and that underpins maybe a paragraph or maybe even a sentence uh, in a paper, and that's repeated 20, 30, 50, 70, 100 times in a paper. We actually have slash used to have a model of how to do this um, in especially history, right? So what you would do is you would write a, a sentence and then you would put a footnote on it and then you would fill three quarters of your page with a long analytic footnote <laughs> in which you describe why what you wrote in that sentence is actually true, what data you based it on, why that was the right data, all that sort of thing. That is great. I'm German. We invented this. I'm very <laughs> fond, of, uh, fond of this. Uh, it is, however, on the way out for various reasons. It's terrible to read. Um, publishers hate it because it's uh, terrible to read. So, so this isn't really ideal. This, by the way, and if you look closely, is an even more terrible version because this is a an end note, and end notes are even more terrible to read than footnotes because you've got this thing and then you flip through and then you lose where you were. And, oh, it's terrible. Um, thankfully, this is uh, 2019 and we have digital technology. Um, so here's uh, what we did instead. So we have an article, and what you see on your left is actually the PDF as published by Cambridge University Press for this particular article article, in this case a PDF, this also works on HTML. And then on the right side, you see this is the same screen, so this is a live screenshot. On the right side, you see an open web annotation powered by a hypothesis, uh, which, in which the author explains what's actually going on in the sentence. That's the analytic note. Then has a short excerpt from the, in this case, primary source they used, and then has a link to the data source uh, on our data repository. On the repository, this is how this looks like. We have, again, a link back to the annotated version of the article, so there is cross-linkage. We have ample metadata, descriptive metadata, data generation process that doesn't apply to individual files, but also applies to uh, the a project as a whole. So why was annotated what was annotated, what was kind of the general data generation process, those sorts of things. And then we have curated copies of all the used files. So these are file format normalized, all the good things that a curated data repository uh, does for you. Um, and because the data are not just uh, using, the, the annotations are not just using open uh, software, they're also using open standards. We could easily pull them in, read out the JSON, and turn that into just a list of annotations. So for whatever reason you just want to uh, look at the whole list of annotations, uh, you can easily do that. And that's very quickly done without any manual work on our, and just through the API. Just to give you a sense of the type of things uh, you can do with this. So this is kind of the uh, case I originally uh, showed you, and this is kind of the original case we envisioned. You have an article, you have a historical source, the source lives on the repository, you explain why you use the source, what it's uh, doing, and uh, you link the things to each other. Uh, there is a link that, a short link, if, in case you're interested, the slides are on Figshare and linked to my force profile if uh, you want to look at them. Um, this is something we didn't expect when we were going in. Uh, they were actually, for copyright reasons, not able to uh, share the full uh, data sources, but they shared extended excerpts, and this was an article published in a general purpose international security journal, uh, so written for generalist audience by people who were uh, Iran specialists. So they were really interested in making Iranian interior thinking about their foreign policy accessible uh, to wider security uh, audience. And so they had all these 
original Farsi sources, um, but they had short uh, <coughs> quotes from them. What they were able to do with the annotations is put extended quotes to them, contextualize the source, and for the other Iran experts reading this, provide the original Farsi of those sources. Kind of so really cool thing that allows different audiences, different levels of access to the data and analytic logic uh, annotating this. And this one uh, is, is one of my favorites, and it's actually from Scotland, so that makes it even better. So this is uh, sociolinguistics, uh, where you have the problems that you write about spoken language, right? Uh, so this is an article uh, writing about uh, the glottal T and how it disappears. So that's your water to water uh, type of thing. That was my terrible butchering of the glottal T. Um, and in a small Scottish fishing village. And so they had all these um, phonetic transcriptions in their article. Uh, this is completely harmless data. So they were able to share uh, their full audio and link it to those transcriptions. So you, you can now actually listen linked in these annotations to the, uh, to the uh, how the people speak. So this really brings the article to life and again, adds a layer of transparency, but not just transparency, uh, also richness. Um, I wanted to briefly talk about some of the things we did to kind of roll this out. We called this the Annotation for Transparency, Transparent Inquiry, and uh, we uh, called the whole kind of rollout where we tested this, the ATI initiative, in two phases. First phase, we uh, approached authors who had recently published articles based on qualitative data and asked them to go back and annotate those articles. Um, we collaborated closely with uh, Cambridge University Press, which mainly, well, both because they're great press to work with, but also because they're one of the leading presses in our area, so they just had access to lots of um, places. We also work closely with uh, Hypothesis, and some of my collaborators uh, happen to be in the room. Um, we have all of this available on, um, uh, online. And then in the second phase, we really wanted to know how do things change if you actually know that you're going to do this while you write. So we tried to identify authors through a competition uh, that were in earlier stages of writing an article and then had them kind of come up with these annotations while they were writing. So these articles were at any page, uh, place to close to submission uh, or kind of like in the early year stages of writing, but they had to be in a working paper format by the time we had uh, a workshop. And then we also paired every paper with a reviewer who read the paper first without and then with annotations. Um, the reviewers kept extended logs, the authors kept extended logs. So we have rich qualitative, of course, uh, data on how this process played out, which unfortunately we're still analyzing. So I have only very preliminary um, pilots on that. Just a little bit more about that second phase. Uh, so we solicited proposals. We paid the authors and reviewers for this because we didn't know how much work it was. It was probably going to be a lot of work. So we got grant funding uh, to support their work on this. Um, we got 80 submissions across disciplines and continents. We selected 19 projects. We had a workshop in uh, November last year. We had the same uh, reviewer author structures. We just got the first article of those set published because it was a law review uh, article. And for those of you who know law reviews, they don't have a traditional peer review uh, process, but go through editorial review, which happens to be a lot, a lot faster than uh, what we typically do. So that's how it, we have the first other articles kind of just entering the peer review process. And that's going to be very interesting how reviewers and review systems interact with that uh, information and technology, and we're following that very closely. We've been very lucky to have very open-minded editors so far who've been willing to kind of experiment with us on this. Uh, just kind of some of the first experiences with this. Um, the time we found people spent annotating uh, per project was roughly 20 to 30 hours with uh, significant variance on uh, either sides of that. Widely uh, varying number of annotations. So some people just put six annotations on their articles that we felt was probably uh, if you have that few, the annotations add very little value. You can just put them in an appendix. Some people put 80, 87 or so on there. That gets a little bit crowded. You have like everything in yellow in your article. So like there's probably some Goldilocks amount uh, somewhere in the middle. Um, 
people use the annotations very differently, as I showed you. Some people also disagreed with some usages of annotations. So one example was for the postdoc group. Some of them were really excited to be able to use annotations to actually update some of your, their argument based on current events, but that gets kind of in tricky territory between, you know, uh, the article was written in 2016 and then you add an annotation in 2018. When is the article, right? There's, there's like a weird uh, chronology thing uh, that's, that's going on there that people were uncomfortable with. Um, um, what we were really surprised, but we as a data repository really thought that people were most excited by this. I can just go and uh, read the original primary source, the original interview, and that we thought was really what this was core about. And people like that, don't get me wrong, but people are really, really excited about the uh, added analytic content because you have a lot of these, uh, a lot of word count restrictions, especially if you write qualitatively, have rich case studies in there. And so the details of why a certain statement was made often get lost, but the authors almost always, or at least the good ones, have answers to that. And so, be, so if you have, are kind of dubious about a statement to be able to click on that and then have like the extended explanation by the author pop up, turned out to be very, very interesting to uh, readers. There is like with all data sharing and transparency uh, issues, big concern about incentives. This is a lot of work. How do we make sure that people who do this get credit for this? Um, and kind of interestingly, there's, there was a lot of interest also in terms of both reading and writing these. Can we typologize these annotations in a way that I can say, I'm only interested in the annotations that provide data. I'm only interested in annotations of these sorts, um, etc. Uh, so uh, next step, uh, obviously, small number of projects so far, like uh, about 40 that we have at various stages in the work. So we want this to be adopted uh, more widely. Uh, we want to facilitate a peer review of that, which is a tricky issue with like, um, because the open annotations live on web content. So where does this live during uh, peer review and how, how does that work? Uh, curation is currently fairly manual, so in this initial phase we had just people annotate PDF articles or Word documents, give them to us, and we converted this to hypothesis annotations. We think there is, uh, this can be automated, and that's something that we have uh, applications for grant funding in, and um, we uh, want to further standardize the instructions. So I haven't stressed this as much as I probably should have given the audience, but uh, all the components uh, we have uh, that make part of ATI uh, are all open source and to the extent possible standard based. So Hypothesis is open, uh, stand, uh, open source. They base it on the open web annotation standards. Uh, we use an open source uh, repository software. So uh, none of this is closed source. None of this has to be done by QDR. And um, uh, what isn't entirely clear is the detailed instructions of what goes in there and how do you do it. And that we'd want to standardize a little further. And Here's my contact info. Uh, please be in touch. I think we have time for one quick question, if anyone has any questions for Sebastian. Here we go. Uh, so you mentioned that there was a pretty wide range of the number of annotations. Uh, did you find that there were a lot of people in the sort of Goldilocks area, or was it sort of bimodal, like people tended to be lazy and put six annotations in or be overzealous and put too many? No, I actually, uh, I don't think it's bimodal. I think uh, uh, we got most people over 10 um, and a uh, few people over 50. Uh, so, so I don't think it's quite normally distributed, but close-ish. Thanks again. Come talk to me later. <laughs>